So we begin our next lecture with a discussion of nationalism, and this is in a way going to become the defining ideology of the 19th century in Europe. And by nationalism, uh, I don't mean patriotism. I mean, very often that will be a very important manifestation of nationalist thought. I'm talking more uh, about uh, ideologically a new way of defining who one is as part of a larger communal identity. And this way of identifying oneself uh, in, in many respects going to be something quite new coming into the 19th century. And the thing about nationalism is uh, it's going to prove so powerful and pervasive, right? That, I mean, it's such a natural way of thinking about who one is uh, in the present day that very often we take it for granted that this has always been how people define their communal identity, right? Their identity is part of a larger community, right? So very often if you're, you know, traveling abroad, for instance, and someone asks you, what are you? Your immediate inclination is to say American, or, or perhaps you might, you know, American is a bit unique, particularly if you're coming from New York, you might define yourself as uh, Dominican or uh, Italian, uh, or, you know, if you're coming from Europe, you might identify yourself as German, French, Russian, and so forth. Right. So uh, it's sometimes hard to realize that if you went back far enough in time uh, and you were to ask someone, what are you in that same vein? Uh, very likely they would not respond in nationalistic terms. Right. If you, you were talking to someone from a small village in France in the 15th century uh, and you said, what are you? They probably would not say French. They might identify themselves by the region they came from, the village, uh, if they're a noble, perhaps by the extended family to which they belonged. Uh, after the Protestant Reformation, they might distinguish who they are based on religion as being Catholic or Protestant, you know, Huguenot. Uh, but they probably wouldn't say they're French. Maybe the subject of the French king. Uh, but this is something a little bit different. This defines more kind of a, uh, a sense of the political hierarchy uh, and a sense of jurisdiction with respect to royalty and so forth. Most historians feel that nationalism as a way of uh, identifying who one is began uh, pretty much with the French Revolution and then, you know, kind of spread from there. Uh, you know, the American Revolution also relevant in this regard. Uh, and, you know, it's not that these are, you know, they are constructed identities, but very often using raw material that does correspond in some fashion to reality, uh, you know, in terms of shared language, shared culture and so forth. Uh, but, but it is a constructed identity and very often then one that actually needs to be imparted to other people. So we're going to find in the 19th century, uh, be, you know, the very beginning of the century, uh, you know, this kind of nationalist ideology primarily evident among educated individuals, often people affiliated with the universities and so forth, uh, who are then going to quote unquote educate their fellow, you know, fill in, fill in uh, the slot, Germans or their fellow Romanians or their fellow Hungarians. Uh, and then part of this, you know, kind of project of educating uh, their fellow uh, uh, you know, fellow members of whatever nation we're speaking of will be also kind of, uh, you know, developing a formal language representative of that people, defining very, in a very specific way cultural elements of that and so forth. Now, very often historians talk about the development of two distinct conceptions of the nation, right? Two different ways of, of defining who and you know why someone is a member of a particular nation. The first one is the liberal model. The second, the romanticist model. Now, the liberal model roughly corresponding to ideals coming out of the Enlightenment that emphasize individual rights and encompass the idea of a social contract between government and the people, right? The citizens of a particular state. And the idea being, right, is kind of contractual. What makes you a member of the nation is that you agree to the terms of this contract, that this government represents you, right, that you abide by the laws of that country, uh, that you take on the obligations of, of citizenship and so forth. 
Correspondingly, the government has an obligation to represent the will of the people. Uh, but the basic idea is it's a very inclusive model, right? Pretty much anyone who agrees to the terms of the contract, regardless of their background, can be a member of that nation. And so, by the way, the uh, you know, American national identity is very much based on the liberal model. Uh, you know, anyone who agrees to the terms of the social contract, right, who becomes effectively a citizen, an American citizen, is American, right, regardless of whatever characteristics they might have, you know, in terms of primary language, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion, in terms of, you know, whatever culture they came from, none of that, in theory, should matter. The second model is the Romanticist model. And in some ways kind of developing uh, as one aspect of a broader kind of artistic and philosophical movement known as Romanticism uh, that constitutes a reaction against the Enlightenment, against the rationality of the Enlightenment. Kind of the idea that not all truths are to be arrived at through the use of reason, logic, rational thought, and so forth. Uh, many truths are understood because there's something that you feel that you have a sensibility of, right? That you experience them through your heart, not your head. And that includes, uh, you know, who you are as part of a larger communal identity or nation, right? Wherein uh, ultimately national identity is defined on the basis of shared national traits, right? So this model will stress uh, you know, kind of the characteristics that define a nation, right? That they share a national language, very often something that to some degree has to be constructed, that they have a shared folklore, uh, shared folk art, local customs, traditions, and so forth. Right? So more precisely, right, just kind of summarizing the liberal model very much reflecting the influence of the French Revolution. So many of these ideas are going to be spread via Napoleon's conquests, uh, you know, different parts of Europe, where he will introduce these ideas and, and amplify them. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of what that actually means in practice, the development of representative, uh, very often parliamentary forms of government, uh, the idea uh, that the government should, you know, somehow represent the will of the people, so increased representation. Uh, so very often the expansion of franchises in terms of, you know, a larger proportion of the population having the right to vote, uh, to hold office, and to participate in the, uh, in the representational process. And very often uh, on the other side, meaning the limiting of, of the monarch's power. Right. So, you know, political, very often when, when we use the term liberal or liberalism in a historical sense, uh, right, uh, it, it kind of corresponds to the idea of favoring rapid change uh, or pro progressivism. Uh, you know, the idea of, of radically reforming governments, social structures and so forth on the basis, in this case, of Enlightenment ideals, right? And, and by the way, very often also conforming uh, to certain ideas about how the economy should run. So often tied to economic liberalism, uh, you know, meaning, for instance, the end of feudal privileges, kind of the promotion of the bourgeoisie as kind of a, a dominant element socially and politically, uh, the elimination of guilds, royal monopolies, uh, and, you know, coming back to the bourgeoisie, definitely the promotion of private property. So by the way, this liberal model of national identity, you know, based on the social contract, you know, very inclusive, anyone who agrees to the terms of that contract, uh, also kind of coinciding with the promoting of the bourgeois element in society is kind of the dominant political and social element. And then against that, we're going to have the romanticist model Right, wherein national identity is conceived as, as being based on shared national traits. Uh, and so very often, you know, and, and again, very often you have intellectuals kind of at the forefront in promoting nationalism. So in this case, very often very active in developing national languages, national folklores and myths. Uh, again, you know, it's not that they invent out of whole cloth, uh, like some new language or... 
uh, you know, for instance, certain myths or, or folk tales. Uh, you know, so very often they will actually, uh, you know, go out and kind of collect this stuff or they might focus on a particular dialect of a language as, as providing the basis of, you know, kind of creating a, a more formal form of the language with a defined grammar, defined spelling, uh, you know, kind of defined vocabulary and then actively promoting that. Uh, the same thing with folklore, also folk art, local customs and traditions. A uh, really good example, for instance, would be the, the promotion of, uh, you know, a particular folk dance or folk costume is somehow representing the nation, usually associated with the peasantry. You know, the idea that this folk costume should somehow uh, correspond to how regular folk uh, dress, right? But it becomes kind of static or frozen in place, right? Uh, the same thing with folk dance, right? You know, the idea that there is, you know, some kind of general sense of, of different kinds of dances engaged in by the peasantry, but then defining a very particular form of that, and then actively promoting that as something that represents uh, the nation, right? Some of this is going to be inspired in part by a resistance to Napoleon, right? A resistance to the spread of Enlightenment ideals, which increasingly come to be associated with France, uh, and to be seen as a kind of foreign element. Uh, and then kind of the idea that we need to cultivate a, a sense of who we are in opposition to that, right? Is something other than French, right? You know, this kind of idea that, you know, the French defined a them, we need to kind of define who the us is in opposition to that. Uh, and so what's really important here is, is that it, it is not inclusive, it's exclusive. Right? It's, it's not a matter of someone choosing to abide by the terms of a kind of contractual arrangement. Uh, it's more the idea that either you share these national characteristics or you don't. Right? So uh, the nation or the people uh, is understood as being defined by, uh, you know, on the basis of these shared char uh, characteristics that you share the same language, the same ethnicity, the same culture and so forth. Uh, and very restrictive, right? I mean, it's very difficult for someone from the outside to assert that they are part of that nation. Uh, you know, I mean, there, you could attempt it, you could decide to embrace uh, this people's language. You know, for instance, I might move to Russia and learn Russian, uh, you know, uh, embrace Russian culture, Russian cuisine, Russian ways of doing things. Uh, but but it be, would be very difficult to uh, find acceptance among Russian people that somehow I'm Russian, right? So in any event, those are the two different models of national identity that begin to develop during uh, the early part of the 19th century in Europe. Uh, and by the way, those two different models are still very much with us today. I would argue that, uh, in fact, uh, you know, we should be careful. It's not a case of, uh, you know, a particular national identity being wholly the one or the other model. Uh, usually it's more a question of emphasis, uh, emphasis. So, you know, American national identity, primarily the liberal model, you know, wherein anyone can be an American is, you know, it's not supposed to matter uh, your ethnicity, your primary language, the culture you came from, uh, what religion you practice. Uh, but, but very often we do see elements of the Romanticist model uh, asserting itself, right? Where there's kind of a sense that you are either more or less American based on your religion, based on you know, whether you were in the Boy Scouts, whether you played uh, minor league baseball as a child, uh, certainly whether your primary uh, language is English. Uh, some of you might remember, uh, you're probably mostly too young for this, but when uh, Obama was president, very often... Uh, you had political opponents try to de discredit him or delegitimize him as president by asserting that he's somehow not really American, you know, because he's Muslim or he was somehow born in Kenya uh, or when he was young, you know, he didn't share certain experiences that many Americans did. Uh, and so this is kind of, you know, an example of the romanticist model kind of pushing itself forward. Uh, but usually, you know, people would push back by asserting the liberal model, right? That it doesn't matter. I mean, okay, he's not actually or wasn't Muslim, wasn't raised Muslim, but it shouldn't matter anyway, 
right? It doesn't matter whether he was in the Boy Scouts or he played minor league baseball. Uh, I mean, it did matter if he was born in Kenya because the Constitution stipulates you to be president, you have to be born in the United States. But I mean, that wasn't really the point, right? It was kind of the idea that he's foreign. And, you know, even if, if growing up, uh, you know, that culturally he grew up in a kind of Kenyan environment, that shouldn't have mattered in any event, right? Uh, so these two different models are beginning to develop towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Some of it is going to inform resistance to Napoleon. Uh, we already discussed how after Napoleon's defeat with the Congress of Vienna, there's kind of an attempt to reestablish the status quo, including the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty in France. So that's kind of providing some backdrop to what is going to be a series of revolutions taking place across Europe. And so they kind of come in two waves. And in each case, uh, the impetus for, the, for these waves of revolutions that are going to spread across Europe, uh, beginning with developments in France, right? So in the first case, it starts with what we refer to as the July Revolution of 1830. Uh, and a lot of this is going to uh, be centered around growing opposition to the Bourbon dynasty in France. Kind of a feeling that, you know, everything that the French Revolution had strived for had been betrayed. Um, you know, so again, how did the Bourbon dynasty end up uh, becoming reinstated in France? It reflected the outcome of the Congress of Vienna, this legitimacy principle being promoted by Metternich right, that it was legitimate to restore the dynasty because they had been in power for ages. Uh, and, you know, the French Revolution represented this kind of d disruptive episode. And so we needed to kind of restore things to the way they were and then pick up from there, right? So the basic idea, restoring Europe to its pre-Napoleonic situation as much as possible. Uh, we should note there was some recognition that some of the changes brought about by the French Revolution uh, and, you know, under Napoleon could not be undone. But the basic idea was to restore things as much as possible to the way they were. And that is going to uh, generate a certain degree of resistance that will finally come to a head in 1830 with the July Revolution, uh, which for those involved really kind of felt, uh, you know, as if, you know, picking up where the French Revolution had let, up, let off, right? From their point of view, what was disruptive, you know, to the way things were headed was the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty. And by the way, the painting we see here, which is very much a kind of romanticist depiction uh, of the July Revolution by a very famous French painter, Eugene Delacroix, liberty leading the people. Uh, and, and this is kind of the romanticist element here. At the center, we see the figure of a woman, uh, the Marianne, which became a symbol of everything the French Revolution represented, right? A kind of romanticist uh, depiction of everything the French Revolution embodied. So the French Revolution, it's kind of ironic, the French Revolution based on, you know, these ideals of the Enlightenment that really elevated the use of reason, of rationality, uh, and so forth, but a kind of fetishizing of the French Revolution, right, where uh, one relates to it on a uh, kind of emotional level, right? And the Marianne, which again, uh, is still with us, is still perceived in France as kind of a symbol of the French Revolution, uh, you know, kind of this romanticist depiction uh, representative of how many French people felt about the French Revolution. So what happened? Uh, you know, so yes, there is growing dissatisfaction, you know, kind of a, a, a feeling of, of you, know, uh, you know, that everything that we had been fighting for remained unfulfilled and so forth. Uh, but, but there are some kind of practical, practical developments uh, kind of underlying uh, what brought about the July Revolution, right? So kind of going back to the restoration of the Bourbons, uh, that was under Louis the 18th, the brother of Louis the 16th, who will rule France from 1814, right, the time of his restoration, until his death in 1824. And 
you know, what happens next kind of reminds me a bit of some of the developments we talked about in connection with the English Civil War. And you might remember there was this kind of pattern of a relatively intelligent, uh, clever ruler followed by a not so intelligent, not so clever ruler. And that kind of dynamic is going to come into play here. Uh, so, you know, understood within that framework, Louis XVIII is the intelligent, clever individual who recognized that many of the changes brought about by the revolution could not be undone, right? So, uh, you know, in theory, he would love to have returned to the kind of absolute monarchy that had existed under the Ancien Regime, i.e. pre-French Revolution, you know, uh, ideally going even back to the time of Louis XIV, but he, sim he simply understood uh, that was impossible, right? Too much had changed. Too many of the reforms brought about by the French Revolution and then by Napoleon uh, had really taken root uh, and could not be undone. And in fact, the Restoration had retained many reforms, you know, that, that could be traced back to the time of Napoleon and the French Revolution. Uh, so you had state schools, right, this, uh, you know, kind of curriculum, kind of education people were receiving that very much reflected Enlightenment thought. You had a legislative assembly. It didn't have much power, uh, but, you know, he's very careful to kind of operate uh, in a way that wasn't really confrontational in that regard. You even had a pseudo constitution and uh, in theory limits on the king's powers. Right. And he, you know, just kind of played along with this to a, to a certain degree. Right. You know, really just not, uh, you know, trying to assert his prerogative as king. Uh, to rule in an absolute way. Unfortunately, his successor, uh, the non-clever ruler, didn't seem to understand that, you know, even if in theory he had the power of an absolute monarchy, uh, you know, trying to actually act in that way would be pretty much unacceptable to the vast majority of French people and would be very provocative, right? Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, he, he didn't really understand that, right? So he's going to operate as if, you know, he was an absolute monarch and he is very vocal about his feelings in that regard, very anti-democratic, anti-nationalist, very pro-absolute monarchy, and is going to work very hard to restore as much of pre-revolutionary France as possible. And that is going to be apparent right from the start of his reign, where he's going to begin uh, promoting policies that are going to prove incredibly unpopular, that definitely demonstrate a complete lack of, of sympathy for how the vast majority of Frenchmen feel, uh, starting with Charles X's pledge to compensate the nobles who had fled the country during the French Revolution for lost property, right? Uh, the revenue... Uh, in order to do this would be raised by taxing the public. So what he's basically saying to the French people is, uh, you know, all those nobles who fled France during the revolution, the émigré, uh, who went to the various capitals of Europe, agitated for uh, the rulers of Europe to unite and wage war against France, who essentially were traitors to France and everything the revolution stood for. You know, I think they should be compensated for the property they lost, and I'm going to tax you in order to raise the revenue to do that. And that's going to, you know, not surprisingly prove incredibly unpopular. Uh, Charles is then going to try to greatly weaken what is already a fairly weak constitution, right? So in some ways, only creating the facade of representative government, uh, you know, meaning he, you know, he pretty much could rule with a fair amount of power, even allowing... Uh, you know, for the Constitution, but he's nonetheless going to try and weaken it. Uh, and then he's going to go after uh, people uh, with respect to religious behavior, right? So uh, in a sense, trying to promote uh, the place of Catholicism within French society by imposing strict penalties for sacrilegious behavior. And by the way, this is at a point where French society has become much more secular, uh, we've already discussed how during the French Revolution, the place of the Catholic Church in France had been greatly diminished. Uh, so he's now going to impose penalties for things like, you know, it could be fines, it could be imprisonment for, you know, not going to church on Sunday. 
And that is definitely not going to fly with the vast majority of Frenchmen. Uh, but then finally, and this proves especially upsetting, is when he attempts to do away with the revolutionary tricolor, i.e. the red, white, and blue, as a national symbol, right? Which is, you know, really a very provocative thing to do, a clear statement uh, of, uh, you know, kind of opposition against everything the French Revolution stood for. Uh, so as you might imagine, he is, his uh, popularity is steadily in decline uh, right from the start of his rule. And then finally in 1830, Charles X does away entirely with the Legislative Assembly, basically you know, eliminating even the facade of representative government, given that that body had up until then generally you know, kind of rubber stamped, just gone along with whatever rules or policy the king had wanted to pursue, uh, and decides he is going to legislate by decree. He will produce legislature single-handedly, this all happens in the month of July, hence why often called the July Ordinances, or more technically, the Ordinances of saint Clo. Um, and so, I mean, first of all, just, you know, the very, you know, way in which he's going about uh, ruling at this point, uh, you know, obviously, you know, kind of uh, completely... Uh, selling out anything the French Revolution supposedly was fighting for, but then the actual decrees themselves designed to enhance his own power. So, for instance, depriving the bourgeoisie of the right to vote, imposing censorship on the press, and eventually the French people have had enough. We see spontaneous demonstrations begin to break out on July 26th, initially dominated primarily by students, uh, which is no surprise. I mean, you know, these are uh, people uh, to some degree highly ideologically driven, uh, highly educated individuals, and, you know, being young, uh, you know, generally willing to, you know, make big sacrifices for change and so forth. But also, and this is in some ways more interesting, uh, a new social group, uh, unemployed, in this case, unemployed uh, people from this social group, workers, right? The Industrial Revolution is beginning to get underway. We see the beginning of a new social group, the proletariat or the working class, uh, many of whom now are unemployed, and so they would, will be very active in these demonstrations. We should note that a one defining element of these demonstrations will be the constructing of barricades, uh, particularly in Paris. And as you might recall, I mentioned how uh, generally, when, when we have revolutionary activity in France, things always start in Paris. Paris is very central to these kind of developments and then kind of radiating outwards. Uh, and so we see the construction of barricades throughout Paris. Uh, you know, barricades, these walls designed to kind of block traffic, uh, you know, very often in, in these kind of major thoroughfares, though at this time Paris uh, dominated by kind of smaller streets. This is, you know, the medieval Paris before, uh, you know, later on it's going to be restructured. Uh, and these barricades made up of basically whatever people can get their hands on. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the French author Victor Hugo, uh, who wrote a book called Les Miserables, literally The Miserable, uh, which, a, you know, kind of a, a central kind of historical context to this book is in fact the July Revolution, and then later on there are subsequent revolutions. And one of the defining scenes uh, in the theatrical production based on that book, uh, often referred to simply as Le Mis, uh, this massive barricade that is constructed on the stage, right? So it just becomes this very kind of defining element. And the purpose of the barricades to prevent the French army from moving freely through the city of Paris. And then here we have, uh, again, the very famous painting by Delacroix, uh, the July Revolution, feature, featuring the Marianne. It's not really quite evident, but you have a sense that there might be something kind of, you know, resembling a barricade in the, you know, kind of background there. Uh, but, you know, where the Marianne becomes the symbol of everything the French Revolution uh, represented and, you know, that now was being fought for in the July Revolution. And things will actually move very rapidly. Almost immediately, Charles X, who is completely taken by surprise by all of this, will abdicate the throne. He will step down. 
uh, and go into exile in London. Uh, by the way, London becoming uh, kind of the place to go to if you're a deposed ruler or political figure. Uh, you can kind of hang out with Karl, Karl Marx in the London, uh, the British Library, I suppose. But in any event, he, he goes into exile. Uh, the Legislative Assembly kind of informally recomposes itself uh, and offers the throne to Charles X's cousin, uh, the Duke of Orléans, who will take the title Louis-Philippe. And why did they offer him the throne? Someone known to be sympathetic to what the French Revolution stood for had actually fought with the French Revolutionary Army. Uh, and France now will effectively become a constitutional monarchy, something especially evident, uh, evident in the way that the Constitution is revised. It, it actually had had a preamble or introduction uh, indicating that the Constitution was a gift, quote unquote, from the king to the people, which kind of implied that, you know, what the king giveth, the king can taketh away, that the king stood above the Constitution. That preamble is now eliminated. The idea now that the king should be subject to the Constitution, related to which they change his title from King of France to King of the French people, right? So, you know, whereas prior, you know, the people uh, owed the Constitution to the French king, it was now the case that the king owed his throne to the people. Again, a constitutional monarchy. Now, the thing is, uh, when this revolution breaks out in France, is very immediately going to inspire revolutionary activity throughout Europe, uh, based also, you know, on many of these ideals connected with the Enlightenment about representative government and so forth, but also on the basis of nationalism. Uh, though, kind of, kind of connecting these two different things, it's the liberal model of nationalism, right? So. You know, very much based on this kind of social contract model uh, where ultimately the goal is representative government. You know, the idea, though, that the government should represent the will of the nation, but is kind of an inclusive nation, uh, again, defined more in a contractual manner. Now, I'm going to look at developments, uh, especially in the German states. Uh, you might remember the Holy Roman Empire is gone, but we have something called the German Confederation. Uh, you know, a loose confederation of these smaller number of consolidated German states that Napoleon left behind. Uh, and also developments on the Italian peninsula, uh, where, you know, just as we don't have a German state uh, in Europe yet, we also don't have an Italian state. We have a number of smaller states. But in both areas, we're beginning to see the uh, emergence of nationalist movements, a German nationalist movement and an Italian one. So I'm focusing on developments uh, in those two regions uh, for two reasons. I mean, one, I think they demonstrate quite nicely uh, the kind of developments that are happening across Europe. Right. So these things aren't just happening there. Right. We're seeing kind of the beginnings of nationalist thought in other places, you know, in connection with kind of Hungarian nationalism, you know, Finnish nationalism, Polish nationalism, and so forth. Uh, you know, maybe a little ahead of the curve in the, the German states and the Italian ones. But, you know, this is uh, something much broader uh, than just those two regions. The other reason, though, I'm focusing on developments there is because uh, you know, they also constitute kind of the, the first stages of a movement towards the eventual unifications of both Germany and Italy, right? And, and those two developments are going to have a major impact uh, on Europe as a whole, not least in, you know, dramatically upsetting the balance of power, right? But let's start with the German Confederation, as you can see on this map. Uh, roughly corresponding to the territories contained within this red line. Uh, the two most important states within the German Confederation are Prussia, represented here in blue, and the Austrian em Empire, represented in yellow. But, but you'll note uh, those two empires have territories both within the Confederation and without. The territories within corresponding to the uh, those areas dominated by people who are ethnically and linguistically German. Uh, of course, the Austrian Empire has many other kinds of peoples in it. 
uh, you know, non-German, uh, German-speaking individuals uh, are not part of the German Confederation, like Hungarians, uh, Czechs, uh, Slovenians, and so forth. Uh, and in the case of Prussia, there is a sizable part of Prussia that is uh, heavily dominated by Polish-speaking individuals, right? So that also is not part of the German Confederation. Now, we should really emphasize, uh, for the most part, these German states, independent states, can pretty much do whatever they want. Uh, but there, there is kind of uh, an attempt at institutionalizing this confederation uh, by creating a federal diet, which will be based in the city of Frankfurt am Main, which is kind of uh, in the western part of present-day Germany, uh, as a kind of consultative body. It doesn't really have any power as far as, you know, any decision taken at this federal diet, uh, you know, can't be imposed on any German state or German ruler against their will. Uh, but it does provide a basis for coordinated action between the different German rulers uh, and for, you know, certain states to influence other ones. And at some point, it's going to become apparent that Prussia, you know, initially it's not clear, it could either be Prussia, it might be Austria, that will end up becoming the dominant state within the Confederation. At some point, Prussia becoming the dominant element. By the way, in case you're wondering, today we just say Frankfurt. Uh, Frankfurt on Main basically means the Frankfurt on the Main River. Main is the name of a river. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we do refer to it as such because there is also uh, Frankfurt on Oder, uh, another much smaller Frankfurt to the east uh, that is on the Oder River. Uh, and by the way, the building you see there is where the federal diet was held. Uh, that building, by the way, was completely leveled by bombing during the Second World War. Uh, they literally reconstructed it exactly the way it was, uh, you know, prior to its destruction, brick by brick, uh, you know, based on they had access to the original architectural plans and so forth. So if you visit it today, uh, you know, you know, kind of uh, impressive uh, example of, of, you know, this kind of reconstructive work. Uh, you do find that throughout Europe. Probably the most impressive would be if you ever have the chance to visit the city of Gdansk in Poland, uh, known uh, formerly in German as Danzig, where the entire downtown was destroyed during the Second World, World War and rebuilt exactly the way it had been prior. So that's a bit of an aside. But in any event, right, we talked about briefly how towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, various peoples occupied by the French, no longer seeing them as liberators, but rather as a foreign entity occupying their country to be resisted. Uh, and related to that, uh, to some degree, re uh, rejecting Enlightenment thought as something somehow definitively French uh, and trying to assert uh, and develop a sense of their own identity as a distinct people. You might remember we talked a bit about this in the case of Spain, right, where we had this kind of guerrilla warfare being waged against the French, but this is also happening in the German states. Uh, you know, there's nothing like a, a them, you know, perceived as a threat, as an enemy to help define who we are as an us. Uh, between the various German states, right? And so they're starting to think about, you know, what is it that, you know, maybe defines us as a collective uh, group, right? As, as, as constituting something bigger than our individual states. What are the characteristics we share? And, you know, in the beginning, when we see the emergence of German nationalism, uh, a very important element of it is rooted in the liberal model, you know, about kind of promoting representative government, you know, social contract, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, we're going to see the emergence as uh, of German nationalism in this kind of romantic, uh, romanticist incarnation, right, where it becomes less about representative government and less inclusive. It becomes more about shared characteristics. And at the forefront of this development are going to be students who begin to organize uh, in the various universities scattered across the German states uh, into student societies known as Burschenschaften. And yes, I might expect you to remember that. Uh, and, you know, so this becomes a way of, uh, 
you know, promoting amongst themselves, but also, you know, in a sense, trying now to, you know, at some point, think about how to educate the larger German public regarding German national identity. And a very important and very influential figure in this regard is going to be uh, a German Prussian gymnastics educator and nationalist known as Turnvater Jan. Uh, his actual name is Friedrich Ludwig Jan. Uh, Turnvater Jan means father of gymnastics, and he is going to preach a kind of German nationalism defined by shared characteristics uh, and very often directed at uh, resisting foreign influence, foreign dress. He's, you know, kind of really urging, especially young Germans to, you know, somehow return and embrace their own Teutonic heritage, right? So a big part of that might be, for instance, trying to eliminate foreign, uh, i.e. French words from the German language, right? You know, trying to define and this is the constructed nature of it, right? I mean, they obviously would base this on, you know, actual practices, uh, you know, the various people uh, engaged in, but really kind of trying to define in a very rigid and kind of fixed sense, uh, you know, what characterizes German culture, uh, German folk traditions, German cuisine, German dance, German dress, and so forth. Right. And by the way, you know, part of this educational program, right, of inculcating within young Germans a sense of their German heritage uh, will be gymnastics, believe it or not. Right. It's kind of the idea of developing young, healthy Germans, right, healthy in body, healthy in mind. You know, and then the question is, how do you promote this, you know, kind of conception of German national identity? Uh, so the student groups will be the primary mechanism for that. And probably initially, the, the primary way of trying to promote German nationalism among the broader public is through popular demonstrations, the most famous of which will be at the Wartburg Castle in the city of Eisenach. And uh, the Wartburg Castle is actually where Martin Luther, uh, during the Protestant Reformation, had taken refuge to avoid persecution, and where he devoted considerable time to translating the Bible into the German language. And you might be asking, well, why are they choosing this particular location? Because they are effectively transforming Martin Luther uh, from a hero of the Protestant Reformation into a German national hero, right? Where uh, one major emphasis is, you know, kind of the fact of his translating uh, the Bible into German. And in fact, it is his German, right? The German that he created in written form. Uh, and, you know, we, we talked about this a bit in class, uh, or depending on when you're hearing this, we will be talking about this. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, at, th at this point, to a fair degree, uh, the language people spoke would have been one of any of a number of German dialects. This is not the language they would have used for the purposes of writing, uh, of any kind of formal communication. Uh, you know, up until very recently, that would have been Latin, but that's beginning to change. People are now developing a written form of the vernacular. And in this case, the German used by Martin Luther to translate the Bible ends up becoming the foundation of a formal uh, form of German, what today we call Hochdeutsch, right? The German that people learn when they go to school, uh, that is used for writing purposes, uh, you know, that, that pretty much is used, you know, on any kind of formal occasion that, you know, increasingly is becoming the only German that people speak, right? As dialects begin to die off. Uh, so this is kind of the thing underpinning how, you know, why Martin Luther is being kind of recast as a German nationalist hero. Uh, the day of the demonstration is October 31st, 1817, which coincides first and foremost with the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, uh, you know, again, now kind of redefined as a very important German nationalist event, which I'm quite certain uh, is not how Martin Luther understood what he was doing, right? But that is, you know, now, uh, and this is on the 300th anniversary of that event, uh, October 31st, 1817. It also happens to be the fourth anniversary of the quote unquote German victory over Napoleon at the Battle of the Nations in nearby Leipzig, right? Which 
you know, we talked about this briefly uh, in our lecture uh, when we were talking about Napoleon, right? I mean, that was not uh, a case of the Germans defeating the French. There were peoples of various nationalities fighting on both sides, Germans fighting on both sides. It was an alliance of various European states in opposition to Napoleon. It was not a nationalistic battle, but it is now recast as such. And by the way, there you see the Wartburg Castle in Eisenach. In the lower right-hand corner, we have a uh, artistic depiction of the demonstration. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of visiting it, uh, but it is really primarily today a, uh, a, a tourist designation for Germans, right? This is really about German, you know, kind of intra-German tourism, right? This isn't really a place that uh, non-Germans are inclined to go, right? Because, you know, for many Germans, even today, it's seen as kind of, you know, marking a very important event in the evolution of German nationalism. Now, uh, at the end of our last lecture, we discussed how uh, Metternich, an Austrian diplomat, had kind of organized the Concert of Europe in opposition to any kind of revolutionary activity in Europe, right? Kind of the idea that, you know, if you see any indication of revolutionary activity beginning to manifest itself in Europe, uh, it should be stamped out immediately. Uh, he, he certainly, as an Austrian diplomat, has tremendous influence regarding developments in the German Confederation. So as you might imagine, right, uh, you know, the, the growing uh, visibility and, you know, proliferation of these student demonstrations in support of German nationalism is not something that makes him particularly happy. So he's, in a sense, only waiting for any kind of excuse to crack down on it. And finally, he gets that when in 1819, uh, a member of one of these Burschenschaften attempts to assassinate a conservative uh, dramatist or playwright, right? So, you know, someone who is, uh, you know, supportive of the status quo and, and using his talents as a playwright uh, in order to convey that message. And Metternich is going to use that as a, a pretext for initiating what's known as the Carlsbad Decrees which end up being adopted throughout the German Confederation. Uh, so basically, it results in uh, the elimination or you know, the dissolving of all the Burschenschaften, and then also the establishment of university inspectors and press censors to kind of cur curtail any kind of you know, nationalist activity or gathering of young German students in support of nationalism. Uh, and in addition, uh, anyone in any German government who had been sympathetic uh, to this kind of burgeoning German nationalist movement is going to be forced out of their position. Uh, and by 1820, all German reform activity had, had ended, right? Like any, you know, anyone in government who saw themselves as a reformer, you know, trying to promote uh, either, you know, enlightenment change related to, you know, kind of trying to make government more representative, uh, and or supportive of German nationalism is removed from their position. Uh, so good question is, is this going to actually bring, you know, German nationalism as a movement to an end? And the answer is effectively no. It basically goes underground. And that becomes especially evident in the wake of the uh, July Revolution in France, which is going to inspire German nationalists uh, to come out in the open, right? It's just kind of this feeling that our time has come. Uh, so nationalist activity is going to flare up following the July Revolution, and we're going to start to see much larger demonstrations taking place, uh, which, by the way, include not just students, but include many members of a rapidly growing bourgeoisie. You know, some of them may be just students who got older, but, but really also reflecting the fact that you know, this, this much larger bourgeoisie, much, you know, more educated individuals, people who are, we're starting to see the proliferation of newspapers, so people are becoming exposed to nationalist ideology. Uh, infrastructure is improving, so there's much more interaction between different German states, so kind of, you know, much more a sense of being part of a larger whole. And probably the culmination of this is going to be the Hambacher Fest of 1832, an all German festival in the city of Hambach, uh, where you just see a huge, uh, you know, kind of turning out, 
in support of German nationalism. And so we're going to see a very similar trajectory on the Italian peninsula, again reminding everyone there is no unified Italian state at this time. Uh, and, and in many ways, this, developments here are going to be very similar to what we saw in the German states, right? So you have young students kind of at the forefront of a kind of burgeoning uh, Italian nationalist movement, in this case, forming secret revolutionary societies known as Garbonari. Uh, very much as in the German case, initially kind of more the liberal model of nationalism, where they're really stressing, uh, you know, the idea of uh, having representative governments, constitutions, and then eventually the unification of Italy, which, you know, is also a goal of German nationalists, uh, in their case, the unification of, of German speaking lands. Uh, the main difference is they don't enjoy the same level of popular support uh, as is the case uh, to the north of them, right, with uh, German nationalism. Uh, and uh, that actually becomes an issue when in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, they uh, initiate a series of insurrections, right, with the idea that, you know, kind of imagining that, you know, once they kind of start a revolt, it will enjoy widespread support. As it turns out, that support never comes. And the, the series of insurrections that take place between 1820 and 21 end up being pretty easily suppressed. And then comes the July Revolution in France, which is going to inspire Italian nationalists very much the way it did German nationalists. Uh, so they become much more visible at this point. But this is where uh, developments kind of go off in a different trajectory. And part of this reflects the fact that some of the territories that Italian nationalists imagine as being part of a unified Italian state are actually part of the Austrian Empire, you know, roughly uh, areas corresponding to the northeast part of modern day Italy. Uh, and also there's still this kind of idea, you know, that there is this major rivalry in Europe between France and the Austrian Empire, though now it's a bit more ideologically based, France representing, you know, kind of the uh, values of the French Revolution and rapid progression. Uh, Austria, you know, if we think going back to Metternich, uh, you know, kind of representing the idea of maintaining the status quo. But in any event, they imagine that they might be able to draw the French into a war with Austria that might actually serve Italian nationalist ambitions. Uh, you know, partly by creating, uh, you know, what they imagine might appear to be an opportunity for the French uh, by setting off a series of revolts in places like Modena, Parma, the, the Papal States, kind of the center of what today is Italy, uh, in the hopes that this would draw in the French, would prod French intervention. Uh, you know, so, you know, off they go with their plan series of revolts take place, but then Louis Philippe, the new king in France, and you know, it's also a new government, uh, constitutional monarchy, proves unwilling to risk his international position by going to war with Austria. Uh, certainly not on behalf of Italian nationalists. And as a consequence, right, no, no help forthcoming from the French and the revolts are quickly suppressed. Uh, and so thus, you know, nothing really uh, comes to fruition with developments in 1830. And some time will pass. In the meantime, there is growing support for nationalism, uh, not just in the German lands and the Italian peninsula, but throughout Europe. And eventually we're going to see another wave of revolutions on a, on a much larger scale. Uh, and again, everything begins with developments in France, right? So we'll start with a revolution in France. This is in 1848. And then very quickly, that will inspire revolutionaries, uh, often uh, those acting on behalf of nationalist movements, to rise up and initiate revolutions in their own territories. So we probably should start with, you know, looking at developments in France. And, you know, you, you might be wondering, why is there going to be another revolution? I mean, they achieved a proper constitutional monarchy. Uh, with the July Revolution of, of 1830. Uh, they have a king on the throne who is entirely sympathetic to that, uh, you know, someone who had fought with the French Revolutionary Army, Louis Philippe. So what went wrong? And in this case, there are both political and economic factors, the latter reflecting that we have this very rapidly growing uh, new social group 
the working class or proletariat. So, first of all, you know, politically, uh, the, you know, things did look very promising uh, after the July Revolution. Many reforms were initiated, uh, you know, at the beginning of what they would, would come to call the July Monarchy. But by the winter of 1847-48, many of them had been undone. Uh, there is kind of a growing discontent, particularly among students, uh, younger people who are perhaps not especially wealthy, uh, but very often coming from the bourgeoisie. So politically, right, that is kind of, let's just say a kind of feeling of uh, unfulfilled potential. Now, this is also a period, however, when the Industrial Revolution is really getting underway uh, across Europe, not least in France, right? So we have a rapid industrial expansion, uh, creating a much larger working class, but then also leading to a decline in their situation, right? So many of them are living in poverty or just barely getting by, uh, you know, living in very crowded, unhealthy conditions. Uh, and then at some point, you're going to have food shortages. So by the winter of 1847-48, uh, you have many people who are actually, you know, finding it difficult simply to put food on the table, a rising cost of living. Uh, and what for many working class people is the primary uh, issue, widespread unemployment. So these two different issues are going to merge and we're going to start to see demonstrations involving both workers and middle class individuals, uh, albeit for somewhat different reasons, but they're kind of joining forces. And these demonstrations are going to begin to take place across France. And at some point, the government becomes concerned and begins prohibiting the organizing of political rallies. Demonstrators uh, try to get around this by, uh, instead of holding rallies, they begin to hold banquets, right? So, you know, the idea that there is no law prohibiting large numbers of people coming together to enjoy a fine meal together, right? Uh, but, you know, of course, it's not really about the food. It's just a pretext for political organizing. And over the winter of 1847-48, you're going to see a large number of banquets being held, these kind of political banquets, roughly 70 in all. And, you know, at some point the government is, you know, quite understands that this is not, you know, really, uh, you know, simply for the pleasure of dining together, that the, these are really uh, political rallies. And, you know, so at some point they ban one of the more major ones planned, a banquet in Paris that was scheduled for February 22nd, 1848. This ends up being the spark that sets off the 1848 revolution. So another revolution, yay. Uh, the French, you know, you have to give it to them. Uh, they, they really are very rapidly becoming famous for their revolutionary fervor. Uh, and anyone who's been paying attention to recent developments in France would, would immediately realize that this is not something uh, that has changed. Uh, so there's been actually quite a few revolutions of late uh, in France. Uh, one of them, uh, people were wearing yellow jackets. Uh, it kind of started out as a protest against the rising cost of petrol. Uh, but very, very quickly became linked to other concerns. And, you know, these yellow jackets were uh, jackets that if you were driving in an official capacity, you were required to wear. Uh, so, I mean, that's just kind of an indication of, you know, how this, this kind of political engagement, a willingness to take to the streets, to demonstrate and so forth, uh, you know, really has uh, kind of become uh, something very quintessentially French. Uh, and maybe maybe it's around 1848 that this is, you know, as, as something kind of definitively French that it's really becoming established. And in this case, it's going to involve both middle and working classes. And as, you know, had happened in the past, they're going to begin erecting barricades in the streets of Paris. Uh, and as happened with Charles X, uh, in some ways, a very short revolution. Louis Philippe almost immediately stepping down. Uh, as is becoming a tradition in Europe at this point, fleeing to England uh, as an exile. And this will open the way for a new form of government. Uh, and so the demonstrators at this point, uh, in, you know, in a way kind of commemorating the storming of the Bastille, marching down to the Hotel de Ville, and then proclaiming uh, a republic, right? It's like we're done with monarchy. You know, even constitutional monarchy, we're going all the way this time. 
Uh, and, you know, at this point, it is mostly moderate Republicans uh, who become kind of the dominant figure, both in terms of, uh, you know, kind of functioning as an interim or provisional government, but also in the development of, yet again, a new constitution for France. Having said that, there are going to be some more radical voices, uh, you know, kind of associated with the working class, uh, who are going to have some influence at this early uh, juncture in, in this revolutionary movement, uh, in this case, in uh, who should be included in the provisional government. And it's mostly because of their influence that uh, Louis Blanc, probably the most prominent socialist of his day, will be a part of the provisional government. So he enjoys tremendous support among the working class, uh, in large measure because of a book he had written called The Organization of Labor, uh, in which he called for national workshops to alleviate what was considered to be the most pressing problem of the day for most working class people, unemployment. Right? The idea that you, know, you, you just can't leave it for the market to generate jobs. Uh, it would be actually a good idea if the government became involved and kind of you know, created jobs through some kind of national programs. Uh, in order to keep people employed. And, you know, by the way, this is very similar to uh, some of what Franklin Delano Roosevelt is going to do during the Great Depression. Now, I probably should say a word or two about socialism, uh, which is really only at this juncture becoming a very, very influential and popular ideology, particularly among working class people. And in many regards, its emergence as a uh, important ideology reflects uh, the uh, results of, of the Industrial Revolution, right? You know, according to capitalism, you know, in theory, so I mean, first of all, this rapid industrialization that is taking place across Europe uh, is generating tremendous wealth, right? But according to capitalism, you know, ultimately everyone should benefit, but that clearly isn't the case, right? What is happening is a small number of wealthy bourgeois individuals are benefiting from rapid industrialization, the vast majority of the working class not only not benefiting, but really being heavily exploited, living in miserable conditions, uh, you know, many of them really, uh, you know, on the verge of poverty and so forth. We already talked about how some of them were beginning to starve to death. So, you know, this became kind of the justification for uh, encouraging greater involvement of the government in the economy. Now, having said that, socialism is really, I think, best understood as a very broad term. Uh, there are, are numerous ways in which government might get involved in the economy. And, you know, there could be uh, many differences of opinions about to what extent the government gets involved. Uh, in this case, it's for the creation of jobs, right? But I mean, it could be more about the distribution of taxes. It could be about the provision, you know, today about the provision of health care. Uh, and, you know, uh, spending on education, things of that nature. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be confused with communism, which could be understood as an extreme form of socialism where the government has absolute control of the economy. But in any event, right, so we have this provisional government mostly represented by moderate members of the bourgeoisie, individuals who are focused more on political reform, uh, and then Louis Blanc, who is, you know, in some ways representing more the interests of the working class. And it's pretty much at this point that you're, you're going to start seeing a parting of the ways between the bourgeoisie and the working class, right? So very quickly, uh, this provisional government, uh, and then, you know, they're going to create a new government uh, with a legislative body. There will be elections and so forth. Uh, and as it turns out, it's going to be dominated by uh, both the bourgeoisie, but also a peasantry that is fairly conservative and whose interests in align very nicely uh, with the middle class. So in the meantime, the middle class becoming increasingly fearful of the working class, who they're starting to see as a threat. Now, the government did initiate some national workshops along the lines proposed by Louis Blanc, uh, you know, maybe given time, they would have proven successful, but initially uh, they don't really seem to be doing much good. What you end up with is lots of workers hanging around Paris with really w what would appear nothing much to do, right? So they, they would come and meet at, the, at these national workshops, but then the workshops weren't really able to assign them any kind of job. 
and you know try to imagine that you're a you know fairly wealthy member of the bourgeoisie maybe you live across the street from one of these national workshops uh, and you're starting to feel concerned about all these unemployed workers that are just kind of milling about many of them look very unhappy uh, you're starting to perceive them as a threat and at some point there is pressure on the government to shut them down which they do at which point the workers rise up in revolt in what comes to be known as the June Days Uprisings. And that will carry on for about five days. Uh, and in the end, the army uh, is brought in. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the army and the government are representing primarily the interests of the bourgeoisie uh, and very quickly suppress the uprisings. Uh, about 1,500 workers are killed, roughly 15,000 deported to the French colony at this point of Algeria. And so we do have a new constitution uh, for what we call the Second Republic of France. The first one was under Robespierre, uh, which provides for a president to be elected by universal manhood suffrage. And it's really at this point that you fully comprehend uh, just how closely aligned the peasantry and the bourgeoisie are. Right. So first of all, the executive branch or office of president will is designed to have real power, right? Uh, in large measure, because people are fearful of the working class, uh, especially after the uprisings. You know, so the idea we have a president who can deal uh, with the working class effectively if necessary, but then they're going to hold elections for the presidency and you'll never believe who wins. Uh, it will be Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, the nephew, uh, and let's be clear, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, so a different individual, uh, and he is elected by an overwhelming majority. And, you know, for the most part, it would seem primarily because of his connection with Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, you know, perhaps uh, for many Frenchmen, hearkening back to the glory days when France dominated Europe, Kind of hard to say, uh, but in any event, this is the outcome in some ways of the 1848 revolution. We'll return to France to see how things develop with uh, Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. But at this point, we turn to again the German states and then we'll look at developments uh, on the Italian peninsula where we're going to see revolutionary movements inspired by developments in France really take off. Now, in the case of the German lands, uh, the focus, they're still kind of focused on this, you know, kind of liberal uh, ideal of representative government, but, but now clearly within the context, clearly within the context of German unification, right? So what they're hoping for is that the German states will unite and that they will then create some kind of nationwide representative body, a national parliament with representatives from all the different German states, right? And this would also provide the foundations for a unified German state. What's pretty clear is that this scheme has absolutely zero support among any of the rulers of the various German speaking territories. Uh, but at this point, you know, revolutionaries are feeling pretty inspired by what's going on in France. Uh, and they decide to proceed without the support of the German rulers. So we see 50 German liberals meeting in the, in the city of Heidelberg in the southwest corner of what today is Germany uh, and basically kind of mapping out a plan for holding elections uh, to create a national parliament, right? And, and actually the elections go through without a hitch. Uh, the, you know, this scheme certainly enjoys a lot of support among the bourgeoisie, uh, you know, scattered across the various German states. In the end, uh, delegates will be chosen on the basis of universal manhood suffrage, meaning all men, regardless of, you know, whatever other kind of qualifications they might have, you know, property, wealth, status, will be able to vote. Uh, no one even talks about women voting. You know, that, that idea is just still far in the future. Uh, so they hold elections. Uh, they end up electing, I think it was like 830 representatives who uh, eventually convene for the very first meeting of a national parliament uh, in Frankfurt. 
you might remember there is this federal diet uh, where there's this kind of representative body uh, representative of the various German states, but it's you know really in the uh, within the parameters of a confe uh, con confederacy. Uh, so they're going to set up shop across the street from the federal diet in the old St. Paul's Church. And so the first convening of this national parliament in Frankfurt at the uh, at St. Paul's Church will be on May 18th, 1848. And there they are, right? And by the way, you know, if you visit Frankfurt today, you can, you know, visit the federal diet uh, and then make your way over to the Frankfurt, uh, the St. Paul's Church, where the first Frankfurt Parliament was held. Uh, I mean, and this is great, right? We have a national parliament. We're done, right? We have a unified German state. Or do we? There's a problem here. It has no official standing none of the German states are prepared to recognize it, right? So there you are, you have 830 delegates, the overwhelming majority, university, uh, university educated, upper bourgeois individuals, uh, and you know, they, they come together. And the problem is they can issue all, you know, the legislation they want, uh, you know, they, they can uh, debate what this, you know, in their mind, in their imagination, this unified German state should do, but they have no way to enforce anything, right? There is no bureaucracy connected to them. Uh, there is no army. There is no police force. I mean, they literally have no way to actually enforce anything. The question is, what are the German rulers who make it clear they do not recognize them as having any kind of official standing whatsoever? What are they going to do about it? Well, they're going to ignore them. And as it turns out, that's a pretty smart plan, right? So, I mean, you know, the, these delegates come every day. They debate, they bicker, they, they issue decrees, legislation, they propose a policy for naught, right? None of this, you know, who knows? Maybe over in the federal diet, they're like, you know, send them some pizza. You know, who cares, right? They, they have no way to enforce anything they come up with. Uh, and the German rulers of the, you know, the rulers of the various German states are simply going to ignore them. And at some point, most of the delegates simply give up and go home. By the end of 1848, you have only a rump parliament, right? Kind of the, the remaining diehards, if you will, uh, the radicals, who eventually relocate to Stuttgart. Uh, at some point, I think they number something like 60, at which point that's when you send the army in to shut down the operation. Finally, they are forcibly disbanded in June of 1849. And, you know, a uh, lot of high hopes coming to naught. Uh, and no doubt, uh, you know, a feeling of disappointment and despair. We'll come back to that later. What about in Italy, right? So the revolution in France, 1848, also going to inspire Italian nationalists. Uh, and this time they, they feel they have a real shot. And some of that reflects the fact that, you know, some things are different. First of all, they do have more support than prior, uh, popular support among the general population. Uh, second of all, as we're, you know, I'll get to in a moment, uh, we see the emergence of one Italian state that might fulfill the role of leader, right, in the event that you're really able to generate some kind of serious movement. And they're still kind of focused on this idea of using uh, the Austrian Empire as a foil, right, the fact that they have control over Italian speaking territories, uh, you know, can be useful as a kind of catalyst for rallying Italian nationalists uh, to the uh, Italian nationalist cause, right? And so almost immediately, nationalists, uh, and this is going to actually lead to some revolts that, that do look like they're going to be successful initially, uh, starting in the south, in Naples and Sicily. And their first immediate demand is Italian independence from Austrian domination, right? So, you know, this kind of focus on liberating, quote unquote, liberating uh, Italian lands from a foreign entity, right? And then uh, the second kind of, of, of part of this would be uh, once having done that, all the Italian states should become unified into a single Italian republic. Uh, 
and, you know, I, I really can't stress enough that, you know, at the beginning of this, there really is this kind of uh, optimism and euphoria that, you know, this time it's really going to happen. Part of this reflects the fact that revolution is spreading throughout Europe, inclusive of much of the Austrian Empire, right? So, uh, you know, Austria also having to contend with nationalist revolutionary movements within its borders. Uh, for instance, we see here barricades being set up in Prague in connection with Czech nationalism, right? Kind of in the northern part of the Austrian Empire. Uh, but even in Vienna, we're seeing revolutionary movement. Right. So, you know, some of this also more about representative government, even at home. Uh, in fact, Metternich, uh, you might remember, we talked about him being one of the most influential uh, political figures in Europe between uh, the Congress of Vienna up until 1848. Well, this revolution is going to compel him to resign. Uh, guess where he's going? You got it. London. Right. Maybe he's hanging out with Louis Philippe. But in any event, he resigns, uh, but in some ways, the real action is happening on the Italian peninsula. And so I mentioned that at some point, one state on the Italian peninsula will kind of emerge into a leadership role with respect to the Italian nationalist movement. You know, the state that at some point Italian nationalists look to, to lead the way, uh, particularly uh, in opposition to Austria, but also the idea that, you know, having, if, if they succeed in, uh, quote unquote, liberating certain territories from Austrian control, they, they could then uh, provide the basis of a uh, unified Italian state. And that state will be the kingdom of Sardinia. Uh, so, you know, obviously, and uh, I would draw your attention right now to the map in the lower left hand corner. Uh, that would include the island of Sardinia, uh, which is color coded there. I think that's salmon pink. Uh, you know, so, okay, yeah, that's where we get the name Kingdom of Sardinia, but probably the more important part of that kingdom would be uh, that kind of salmon gray territory to the north uh, known as Piedmont, literally uh, meaning foot of the mountain as in foot of the Alps. Capital is Torino, in English, Turin, and the ruler is Charles Albert of you can say Sardinia or Piedmont. It basically means the same thing. And they are looking for him to lead the fight against the Austrians and unify Italy. And during you know, the early stages of this kind of revolutionary activity in 1848, there is tremendous enthusiasm for the national cause, which is going to create pressure on the various Italian rulers who very quickly begin supplying troops to fight alongside the Sardinians. Primarily, of course, because, you know, if, if this kind of Italian nationalist sentiment is really as fervent as it appears, uh, it might be directed against their rule, right? So they really do feel a need to demonstrate their support. Uh, and so off their troops go to fight alongside the Sardinians and initially things looking promising, even taking some territory from, uh, from the Austrians. But this cooperation ends up proving short lived. Now, part of it reflects divisions that emerge uh, among Italian nationalists, right? Between those supporting constitutional monarchy and those in favor of a republic. And the rulers of the various Italian states who were never really, you know, genuinely supportive of what's happening, uh, prepared to take advantage of any kind of division that might emerge. Probably more importantly is at some point it really becomes apparent that Many quote unquote Italians don't really feel Italian yet. Uh, simply they have stronger attachments to the regions they came from. Uh, you know, when it really becomes clear that the ultimate goal is a unified uh, Italian state, some of them are, you know, like kind of, wait a minute, do, do I really want to be part of a larger Italian state? Uh, and as soon as these divisions become apparent, uh, the various rulers of the Italian states uh, are going to take advantage of this. Starting with the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily, right, where eventually we're going to see a counter-revolution take place, uh, basically aimed at suppressing Italian nationalists in that particular kingdom uh, and bolstering the power of the king. You know, they started making promises about some kind of constitutional government and so forth. Uh, so now just kind of, you know, really restoring absolute monarchy there and then eventually withdrawing their soldiers from fighting alongside the Sardinians, 
And, you know, you have a kind of domino effect at this point. Almost immediately, other Italian states are going to follow. And eventually, we have Piedmont fighting by itself against Austria. And, you know, they're, uh, they have a formidable army, very brave soldiers. You know, no one is doubting their valor. Uh, but they simply by themselves are not capable of defeating Austria and very quickly become overwhelmed. And by August 1849, Austria had restored its control over its territory in the north of Italy. And the, this you know, kind of Italian nationalist movement came to an end without a unified Italian state, of course, right? So, you know, in both the German and Italian cases, it really, you know, it does seem that they failed. Certainly that was the feeling at the time among German and Italian nationalists, you know, a, a real feeling of bitter disappointment. Uh, but, you know, historians looking back with the benefit of hindsight kind of recognize that something really did change. This is as if support for nationalism in both states had crossed a kind of threshold. Uh, and from this point forward, you know, growing exponentially, right, in terms of the level of support it enjoys, until at some point political figures realize they can't ignore it. Uh, but they also realize that it's something they sh shouldn't necessarily be fearful of. It's actually something they can take advantage of, right? And uh, we're really going to see how that plays out in the second part of this lecture, uh, a major component of which will be focused on uh, kind of completing the story of German and Italian unification. I mean, we'll be talking about some other developments as well, but that... Uh, is in many ways kind of central to our discussion. Um, and so I won't get too much into that now. I'll just leave you with one last thought, right? You know, this, this kind of development that sees political figures exploit and to some degree manipulate nationalist sentiment. Uh, what do you think? Does that kind of thing still go on today? Right? So uh, this marks the end of this part of the lecture. Uh, and, you know, you might ponder that question before you turn to the second part.